Welcome, uh, everybody, to uh, the first uh, of our, our seminars uh, on uh, new perspectives in translating and interpreting studies. I just want to say um, just a, a word or two about um, the idea behind these uh, seminars. Um, more than 10 years ago, uh, with Louisa Semlian, who was the, uh, the senior commissioning editor for uh, language and linguistics in, in Routledge, uh, we got to talk about the idea of uh, a new sort of series of, of books in translation studies. Uh, they will try and look at translation uh, from uh, different uh, perspectives. Uh, if you like moving away from the, the classic uh, approach of kind of textual uh, comparison and looking at other ways of thinking through uh, the idea uh, of, of translation, how we might uh, think about it, uh, and also um, how translation itself uh, might be brought into wider uh, political, uh, social and cultural debates uh, in uh, society. Um, so the uh, series was uh, launched in 2012, so this uh, year we're celebrating um, a, a decade of, of titles uh, in the in the series, uh, and of course um, we couldn't have uh, found a, a better person uh, to launch uh, the, the the series uh, than uh, Sherry uh, Simon, who has consistently uh, been one of the most original, uh, creative, uh, stimulating, and exciting. Uh, thinkers uh, in translation studies uh, and broadening our, our notion of what might constitute uh, translation. Um, Sherry has the, uh, the distinction of not only having one title uh, in the series but, but two. Um, so um, today um, we'll be looking at both of those uh, titles, uh, Cities in Translation, the first a title from 2012, and then more recently, uh, Translation Sites, a, a Field Guide. Um, Sherry Simon was uh, born in Montreal. She was educated uh, in uh, Canada and, and France, where she did a master's degree under the supervision of uh, Roland Barthes. Um, she's the author of many, many uh, prize-winning prize uh, works, um, largely focused in, in translation studies and in Canadian studies. Uh, she's a member of the uh, Royal Society of, of Canada. And until very recently, I think, Sherry, if not mistaken, it's probably a week or two weeks ago, um, you were a distinguished university research professor in the uh, in Etudes Francaises in Concordia University. Um, so I think you're a, a freshly minted retiree uh, from the, uh, the, 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 the university. Um, so, Shay, I wanted to sort of um, be, begin, if I may, with um, the first title, uh, the one that sort of set this uh, series off, um, Cities and Translation, Intersections uh, of Language and, and, and Memory. And to ask, is it fair to say that, that the kind of the idea for that book grew out of your earlier book from uh, 2006, uh, Translating Montreal, Episodes in the Life of a Divided City? I mean, were, were you in a sense translating that sort of multilingual translational experience of Montreal into uh, other sites uh, around the, the world? Or were you, were, were you already thinking about all of those different urban experiences when you wrote the Montreal book? Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Such a pleasure to be with you. Uh, everyone can hear me fine. The sound is working well. Great. Uh, and I may, if I may ask for a blanket excuse, it's early in the morning for me. Uh, so <laughs> uh, uh, I'll try to be as articulate as possible. Um, yes, Michael, that absolutely true. I mean, it, it is true that I had, when I was writing Translating Montreal, uh, I'm always surprised when I go back to what I've written before somehow to see that I've already been thinking about what I thought was a new idea, but uh, was already there. I was already thinking a little bit. I think I mentioned Trieste and maybe Prague already in my book in Montreal when I was trying to think of what I was what I was trying to get at when I was talking about Montreal. That some of it was intuitive. It was a city that I grew up in. Um, I understood that the city, it, it didn't take a great deal of, uh, it didn't take a rocket scientist to understand that the city of Montreal was a city of translation. Uh, Montreal was a city that had two rival communities and my 
um, my childhood corresponded to a moment of change in uh, radical change in the relationship between those communities. So whereas in the 40s and 50s, you might be able to speak of a bilingual city in the 60s and 70s and 80s, you spoke of a city that was becoming increasingly and aggressively francophone. It was a city being translated. It was a city um, in a province that was becoming increasingly nationalistic and whose language was um, uh, important to the identity of the city. This Montreal had to be a francophone city to be a capital of the new province or you know, that was the time of the separatist movement, so possibly even the new country of Quebec. Well, the country of Quebec didn't happen, but uh, Montreal was to be a francophone city. And uh, this was the spirit of the times. This was this what, what was happening, and it was happening in, a, uh, in many metaphorical ways, but it was happening in many literal ways, so that when we came to uh, the 1980s, there were language laws uh, which um, made for the importance of French being a public language. So the language of the city was to be French, so the city was literally increasingly occupied by the French language. So you could see a movement. But what interested me more than this kind of official kind of translation were the various kinds of translation projects that were taking place so that you had individuals in the city because of their their literary projects who participated in movements of translation and also their literal movements across the city. So um, uh, where did individual, if you were a translator, you might leave your neighborhood in this part of the city and move to that part of the city and moving across the city meant translating in both senses, in the literal sense, moving uh, across um, and in the uh, sense of translating uh, languages. So um, I was fascinated by what was happening in Montreal. I was fascinated by the kinds of translation that I could see being written before my eyes, um, as it were. Uh, but always in the back of my mind, you know, what's so special about Montreal? Why are you so taken with Montreal? What is is this a special case? Is it the only city of its kind uh, that inspires these? You know, it was a, it was a, it was an exciting time. Um, it was also a scary time uh, because um, to be in a neighborhood where you perhaps weren't welcome. I was born I, I, as a child. <laughs> I, I'm an anglophone. Uh, being in, sometimes being in, in the Francophone part of the city was an uncomfortable feeling as a child. I felt that I was misplaced. And this early experience of being um, with another identity, sort of brushing up another identity, which was so meaningful, um, uh, you know, both, both a, an object of desire because that's where things were happening and you wanted to be there, but fear because maybe you weren't wanted and you were in the wrong place. So this sense of a small place being um, uh, offering these uh, conflicting uh, emotions as well as the idea of translation as a way in which the city was being, through which the city was being created in different ways. And not just one sort of translation, but but many, depending on where your situation was. So I was therefore curious uh, to 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 understand if there were other models, and I was very taken by this idea of the of differences of translation as being the uh, issuing out of a small place and. I was indebted to Michael Cronin at the time for his very, very lovely idea of what he called endotic translation, where he used the example of Xavier de Mestre. I, I just love that example, Michael, of uh, I, which I've, I haven't read, actually, I never got around to reading, I must read it, um, uh, of uh, this, this, this 
guy, I don't even know exactly, uh, Mike will know the year, but uh, where he, he, he can't story. move across the room. He has difficulty moving. His, his whole life is in case, encapsulated in the space of his room and moving through the room is, is hugely significant. So the idea of how small spaces can be charged with huge differences. So I guess that paradox, the idea of smallness and largeness. Mm. Just taking the idea of the way in which, so the, the kind of small spaces that, that you mentioned there, and then how in cities in, in, in translation, you, you're then moving to these, you know, larger spaces uh, globally. Um, and one of the things that, that, that strikes me in, 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 in the cities that you discuss, you know, Barcelona, uh, Trieste, Calcutta, uh, uh, Montreal, um, is the um, sense in which all of them, there, there are, and you've already uh, mentioned this, Sherry, the, the questions of, of, of language and power and who controls language and at what time and for what purposes and, and so on. And just in the, 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 the sort of the, the chapter, on uh, Calcutta, Calcutta, um, you, you talk about the uh, the contribution of translation to the Bengali uh, Renaissance, the, the, the extraordinary number of works uh, that get translated into the language uh, at the at the time. Um, so, do you think that one of the things that the kind of the colonial experience of that city um, demonstrates is, is on, on the one hand, you know. The, the very the kind of the baleful consequences of of, of colonial uh, oppression, but also how people use translation as a as a form <clears throat> as a form of, re of resistance, uh, as a as a form of kind of, if you like, uh, turning circumstances that are that are not always very favourable um, to their own uh, benefit to, to something that allows them to build a community. This was a very exciting one. I was doing my research on India. It was a very exciting time in terms of uh, post-colonial thought and and looking deeply into the more conventional ideas of oppression and um, and power that had been, um, I guess, inherited from a Marxist uh, point of view, maybe uh, where where things seemed very cut and dried and. There were those who were in power and those who didn't have power, and then Polo's colonial thought came came along and um, um, uh, tried to rethink this and and ask if if the subaltern can speak and if there is a way of and if the empire can write back. So these were uh, in both important works of the time, and uh, and it's always um, I guess it it. it still astonishes me the extent to which translation is overlooked in these discussions. Um, we now know that uh, Gayatri Spivak, well, has, 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 uh, has remedied that to a great extent. She talks, uh, she has uh, spoken so much about translation. In fact, a new collection of her works has just come out that's called On Translation, I believe, or In Translation. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the emphasis on translation um, has come uh, through her work, but for such a long time, these relationships of language and power were discussed um, with with no reference to the actual translation of work. And when you looked at the Bengali Renaissance, well, my goodness, it was just uh, astonishing uh, to see how translation became a tool of uh, Indian uh, resistance, and in this case, the resistance in, in, in the city of Calcutta. Well, around the city of Calcutta. I think I stretched things a little bit, but there, there was in the city of Calcutta, which became Calcutta, uh, a great deal of, uh, of translation activity. And like Montreal, um, I looked for characters, I looked for translators, uh, actual people, who had walked the streets and who had, um, you know, worked on uh, different translation projects, and um, um, and I found uh, this uh, fellow called James Long, who was an extraordinary man, um, who was a, an, a missionary but also the founder of uh, the first uh, 
social sci organization of social sciences in, in Bengal. So he was a, an Irishman uh, who, uh, who just understood the importance of the Bengali language. He translated into Bengali. And I just love the stories of him walking up and down the streets. And it is said that he knew every alleyway of uh, Calcutta. He knew, uh, and very fittingly, um, like Montreal, um, uh, he lived in the center of the city. There was, at the time, um, what what was known as black town white town well these are colonial terms um here we could talk about the francophone or or the way um these terms are used in africa as well la cité and so the colonial terms but there was sort of the colonial town and the native town excuse the expression but he lived in the middle he lived in the gray zone right he lived between these two uh areas and i like that very much because of my my my, my pride in, in Montreal is that I also, you know, have lived uh, between the two uh, rather than in one zone or the other so that these cities that are divided in many ways also offer the possibility of this middle zone and the middle zone is often where you will find the translators. One of the, um, uh, you, you talk about, by James Long, by this um, Irishman kind of walking the, the streets uh, of the uh, of the city, and I was I was thinking about another uh, Irishman who, who walked the streets of the city because this year is the centenary uh, of the publication of Ulysses in 1922. So a lot of events uh, here in Dublin uh, around this, and of course one of the first cities, the very end of of Ulysses um, that Joyce mentions is the city uh, of. Uh, of, of Trieste, and of course this is, um, you know, one of the other cities that becomes a kind of a, a focus uh, of um, your uh, analysis. And to some extent, Joyce with his polyglot interest, you could see why he's attracted to the city of, of Trieste with, with German, uh, Italian, and, and, and Slovene. Um, and in your, your chapter, you devote a lot of uh, attention to the, the kind of, the, the, the career and thinking of, of Italo Svevo, um, you know, the, the, the man with the kind of the, the German library and, and the Italian manuscripts, so it's a moving between the, uh, these um, languages. And it, do, do you think there's a sense in which, and, and this applies also to a, maybe a, a Slovene uh, writer like uh, Boris Bachor, except perhaps in a, in a in much more tragic way, but that, that in cities where there are uh, several languages, there are all these kind of translation zones, that it becomes a kind of an exercise in, in boundary maintenance, that, that what, what language contact and translation does is it, it leads to um, an exercise in self-definition, that, that, that Svevo discovers the kind of the Italianness of his language, not through some kind of in, in, endogenous plunging into uh, Italian literature and language, but more through that contact uh, with particularly uh, German German literature, so, it's, 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 so I, I suppose our um, translation zones always zones of self definition, and in, in, at some level, and 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 they're but they're always changing. So your 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 sense of yourself or your sense of the culture, and uh, uh, Trieste is again. Uh, uh, I was going to say tragic because maybe just because I was repeating your word, but. Uh, you know, there's so much desire in the history of Trieste to become Italian. So, the uh, Trieste is 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 a another cas de figure. You know, another another case of how these languages interact. So, uh, Trieste has always been in a geographical Italian zone across the Mediterranean. Um, but linked sort of across the mountains with Austria-Hungary, and Austria-Hungary kind of uh, uh, took it as its port. But it th there was seemingly nothing natural about that. <laughs> the natural part or the geographical part is is being part of this this southern Italian zone, and for for most of the 19th century, uh, Trieste is wanting to become Italian, is wanting to join this this cultural zone um, and uh, has this administrative uh, link with German. Um, and then when 
when it finally does become Italian, it's sort of not no longer quite the interesting city it was, uh, and 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 it becomes more insular. Um, it's this 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 very rich moment of tension among languages, especially uh, uh, towards the end, towards the turn of the century, that is so fascinating. And one element of this richness is the fact that, um, and you mentioned it very well, the books are German, the writing is Italian. So the, the, the knowledge, a lot of the knowledge uh, comes from the German language sphere. And Trieste is the gateway um, of uh, psychoanalysis from German into Italian. It's in Trieste that Freud is translated, but not only translated, that Freud is adored uh, there's a kind of religion of Freudianism among the uh, uh, intellectuals in uh, in Trieste, and it's just fascinating to read about. There, there are a group of them. Uh, Giorgio Voghera is one of the names. He's uh, written a great deal about uh, about this milieu and about the ideas that come through. And you have a character like Eduardo Weiss, who's a uh, psychoanalyst who ends up by going to the United States. Uh, later and in exile in the United States, but he translates Freud. He's the first translator of Freud into Italian, um, and he translates Freud, but he translates Freud in a very strange way, uh, so that the ego and the, uh, he, it, what we call very strangely ourselves, the ego, because why is it called the ego? Uh, Freud just said, I, um, we, we say the ego, the id, and the id, um, we use Latin. Uh, um, Eduardo Weiss kept the S in German. He translated everything else. He called it the EO, the I, but he kept the S in German. And I've always wondered if he did that just because he lived in Trieste and wanted to ground this somehow um, in, in, a, in, yeah. in, in this German-Italian uh, mixture of Trieste. Um, or if the German language represented something for him, <laughs> I would have to psychoanalyze. Uh, Eduardo Weiss, um, yeah. but a fascinating uh, um, uh, cauldron of ideas uh, yeah. created yeah. by this mixture of languages. I suppose, I mean, partly I think with the, you know, the id and the ego and all that in superego in English, uh, I think those terms are, are quite deliberate as a, as a way to kind of legitimize um, the, you know, psychoanalytic thinking, because what straight you know, this wanted to do was to give psychoanalysis is a kind of scientific gloss and one of the ways that you gave uh, you know psychoanalysis a scientific gloss or legitimated in the eyes of the medical faculty was to kind of use these uh, latin terms you know that that would give a kind of a heft to it yes. whereas if you just say the the i you know the the over or something that wouldn't uh, <laughs> it wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't quite pass muster um if i could return to um the uh to, to montreal for uh for a moment um and you you mentioned you know when you were describing the kind of the the, the linguistic uh situation and, and 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 tensions uh in 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 montreal the the, the, the uh, with english and french um but the one language that um maybe I want to dwell on for a moment or two is is, is yiddish you know that so because you talk about the, the three kind of modernisms that we find in montreal so there's the, the french uh speaking moderns with uh Botra, and then we have um scott and the kind of emerging english modernism but then it's kind of the um Yiddish uh, modernism and a sense in which this kind of third modernism is a sort of a, maybe a, a third space in the the city. Is it, I mean, do you think there's a sense um, of that what thinking about Yiddish modernism does uh, in a kind of translation space is, is a notion of, of of triangulation that that you know that, that we get. Um, cultures, you know, that you get the kind of the, this explosive sort of collision of binaries, you know, you know, languages in a, in a kind of a face off, with, but that a language like uh, Yiddish in, in Montreal, um, Slovene, uh, perhaps in the case uh, of, of, of Trieste, possibly French in the case of, of Barcelona, the, 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 the other city you discuss, that do, do, are these, you think, languages that, that, that um, if translation itself is a, is a triangulation exercise, you know, you're kind of moving between the two to create this kind of third. Is there a sense which that's what Yiddish is doing in Montreal? 
That, that's a fascinating question. Um, I, I've, um, I, and I like the fact that you bring up these other cities with their third modernisms as well, because I've always wondered to what extent um, this was, again, sui generis in Montreal, to have these three modernisms not only coexisting, but being founded in Montreal. So it's not as if they just found themselves, some of them were outposts of other modernisms, but these three movements uh, grew at the same time, uh, I'm going to say, to some extent, in ignorance one of the other, but not entirely. Um, uh, there would be no link, there would have been no link between Francophone uh, modernism and Yiddish modernism, or very, very little, if only that you had the, uh, perhaps, one or two individuals who would have been able to jump those 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 hurdles but again it's the fascination of seeing these very these movements that will become um you know um f who, which will give rise to to very important and long lasting movements um taking root um in the same general geographical area, we're talking about blocks, we're talking about bicycle rides. I like to measure distance in bicycle rides. It's quicker than walking. <laughs> um, the, you could easily get from, from, from one to the other uh, uh, on the city space, and yet they remained so separate. So separate, and yet um, over time, of course, they will they will uh, be linking up, and the 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 way they the way they will link up will be reflected by their different specificities. So um, they are tempered one from the other, and there is a very interesting uh, triangulation uh, over time through translation, through translation, but not not as as they as they come together. Uh, but that idea of space um, is, is so interesting that you could have maybe not right next door, but uh, you know, uh, not that far away. Um, I, I was I had fun locating on the on on the map uh, the centers or the salon, uh, which would have been the centers of each of these uh, modernist movements and and actually where they would be um, and um, uh, and put them. Uh, put them on the map so you could see the Salon of Ida Maza, who was the Salonnière of, or one of the Salonnières, but one of the important ones, of uh, the Yiddish uh, language movement, and she would have been near the center of the city, uh, near the mountain. And then you had Frank Scott, who had a Salon of the English language modernism, a little bit over in Westmount, and then Boldura, uh to the east. Uh, on um, on on uh, Mont Montana, so th that was very that was very interesting. Just taking this 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 notion um, of 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 space and and and, and, and spatial metaphors and, and, and kind of spatializing uh, translation, I kind of we want want to, to, to move on here uh, to the uh, the second um, title in the series, uh, translations sites a field guide where. You kind of move from consideration uh, of of cities uh, to looking at particular sites, and it's a lovely kind of mixing up of real and imaginary sites uh, in 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 the book. So, the monument, the opera house, uh, the hotel, church, a tower, bridge, uh, library, uh, checkpoint. Um, and one of the things that intrigues me um, is the a subtitle. Uh, it's translation sites, a field guide. Um, why field guide? Where is this uh, notion, <laughs> notion coming from? Yeah, well, a, a field guide, it, it, I, I, I think it's more usually related to, to, to a botanist's uh, 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 collecting. Uh, so uh, there, there's a field guide or, or, or just, just a guidebook. Um, the idea of uh, let's collapse the two. So the idea of traveling and and of collecting uh, at the same time. So um, I realized that uh, um, uh, it, it, uh, uh, over time I had collected these places um, in my mind uh, that had resonances, that had uh, particular resonances uh, for me, but that at the same time 
uh, were indicative of certain kinds of um, uh, translational mechanisms um, so that each chapter is uh, I had fun with especially in, in when in in the French edition as well that we had fun with sort of dealing with three levels for each um, uh, chapter because there's a, a generic uh, then there's the, the actual place and then there's the affect or the type of translation that I'm trying to talk about so it, it was a yeah, it's a complex idea. I, I, I hope it works in the end. Uh, but it, and it's interesting that you say that there's uh, real and imaginary places because somehow in my mind, the real and the imaginary kind of melded. There's so many, well, I became a movie like Arrival for me from, by Denis Villeneuve. Uh, it was, it's very real. <laughs> I've, I've, I've thought about it so much and I can see those, uh, those, uh, strange looking spaceships arriving and uh, uh, so, so, so it's very real that there's um, it's it's almost like a real thing uh, uh, books traveling you know they all they all uh, come together in your imagination and your consciousness at some point so that there's hard to distinguish one from the other absolutely I think the way in which you know we, we how we we translate city, cities into kind of imaginary landscapes and, and then reciprocally translate I mean, I think that's a beautiful thing in, in Talo Calvino's uh, Invisible Cities, where, you know, the, the book at some level is an extended meditation on the city of Venice. Um, but when you visit Venice, the cities of Calvino are there with you as you react to, the, you know, the different... Um, one, one of the, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, remarkable kind of uh, coincidence um, or uh, act of, of, of prescience in terms of the, the context in which we find ourselves in immediately now uh, today is that you um, the book opens with a space of um, synagogues in Lviv um, in, uh, in in the Ukraine and I, I would just like to um, express our, our solidarity with with colleagues uh, translation studies colleagues uh, in the city uh, of, of of Lviv some of whom uh, may be listening into our, our conversation and our our thoughts are very much with them uh, today. Um, but you, you look at the, um, you know, the, obviously the, the extraordinary kind of history uh, of, 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 of Lviv, which um, between 1918 and 1945 changes hands eight different times. It has different names, Lviv, uh, Lemberg, Lvov, um, Leopolis. Um, and so one of the things you register in, in that, that uh, piece about the space of, of, of synagogues is, is the sheer violence uh, of erasure, wanting to erase the traces of a particular group, a particular language uh, in, the, uh, in the city. And you mentioned uh, a Ukrainian uh, translator, uh, Yurko uh, Prokashov, um, who translated the uh, Yiddish poems of a leading uh, Yiddish modernist, uh, Deborah Fogel, um, who was murdered um, in the Lviv uh, ghetto in 1942. Uh, and you make the, you kind of put, um, take on this idea of that one of the things that translation does is that it, it, it's, it, it's an act of memory, that, that you know, it's, it's, it's and, and where memory becomes a kind of, of moral force. I mean, do you, do you think that, that in looking at the city of, of Lviv, and, you know, which is experiencing these things as, as we speak now, um, that what the violence of erasure is, is, is trying to force people into a non-translation zone to, 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 to kind of remove. And what translation does is that it, it, it carries with it the memory of, of difference. It, it, it's a kind of, it's a process of, of, of anti-erasure. Do you think that's, would that be a fair comment? And... Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, and thank you for, you know, recalling the Viv and uh, also, you know, thinking of Kiev and uh, and people all across Ukraine. Uh, yes, um, I just want to maybe just begin with um, recalling something that happened at the beginning of the Ukrainian war, um, which was um, that uh, very soon after that uh, uh, the Russians um, trying to take out a, a television tower just outside of Kiev um, uh, actually 
uh, bombarded uh, Babi Yar, what I call Babi Yar, but they call it Babin Yar now, um, I guess in Ukrainian. And uh, Babi Yar was uh, the place uh, in the during the Second World War uh, where um, um, a, a huge number of Jews were um, uh, were were killed by 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 um, rifles. They were killed. Babi Yar was a, a, um, a ravine. It's a ravine just outside of the city, and there was a what became um, a notorious name. Uh, Babi Yar, uh, because uh, these uh, Jews were just uh, uh, shot down, uh, thrown into a pit, and um, that was part of what became what has become known as the Holocaust by bullets, so um, rather than uh, by gas, and um, so the um, Ukrainians um, just be in the last years uh, because this site has been in a sense neglected, um, the Ukrainians have been building a museum. So the Ukrainians who had a, a, a in, in relation to, uh, to, to the Jewish Holocaust had a, a kind of ambiguous role uh, uh, during that time. Um, and, uh, but over the last years have been doing the work of memory to construct a museum. So, to, to revive the memory of this place in Ukrainian for uh, the Ukrainian population. And then the Russians come and destroy this museum. Um, and just, just one little twist on this. So I'd written a little uh, thing on this for, uh, for Quebec Pen. And I mentioned the very, very famous poem by Yevtushenko, uh, who, is, who is a Russian poet. Russian dissident poet who made this place known world over in his poem called Babi Yar, very, very powerful poem from the 1960s. And I mentioned Yevtushenko in the little piece I wrote that was to be translated. And the Ukrainian translator said, I won't mention this man, he's Russian. These are the paradoxes of history. So the Ukrainians rehabilitating the place, the Russians uh, uh, destroying it, the memory of Yevtushenko, the dissident Russian poet, not welcome today in Ukrainian. These are paradoxes and movements of translation and memory that are um, uh, ever so tragic. So. That was just my introduction, sorry, to this, uh, the, this monument in Lviv is something like that because what was so amazing about the space of synagogues in Lviv is that it's a monument that was created by the administration of the city of Lviv. So the current Ukrainian administration of Lviv as a public monument, in other words, no, not as a Jewish place of memory. Of course, there are Jewish places of memory everywhere, but it was the Ukrainians who created this place the cre and who created a, um, um, who had a, a competition for this space and who, who um, created this space as a space of memory and translation. So on the various gravestones, and you'll see pictures that in, in the book, the various gravestones have inscriptions in Yiddish, in the language in which the uh, words were spoken, and then translated into the various languages of memory. Hebrew as a Jewish language of memory, English as the kind of international language of memory, and Ukrainian as the language of of the place and the coexistence of these languages is extremely meaningful and shows how the, this memory is always carried forward um, in different and 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 uh, in, in differential relations uh, one to the other and uh, one of the quotations is by uh, Deborah Deborah Vogel Vogel. Um, whose own history is absolutely fascinating. She was one of, she was the first 
one of the first or perhaps the first woman to have a PhD in Polish literature as a Jew and then she becomes a Yiddish language she learns Yiddish she learns it it's all part of her she learns Yiddish and becomes a Yiddish modernist she's a very good friend of Bruno Schultz I think they have a love affair uh, but her parents won't uh, let her marry him and uh, um, and her work is published in Yiddish uh, now very recently translated into uh, English but also as you mentioned translated into Ukrainian and all these translations carry very different charges of memory um, as shifts and as openings into new publics new um, ways of appreciating her work yeah absolutely and and and, and the, the, the act of tr translation is, is, is an act of kind of reconfiguration I, one of the things that's very interesting about you know, the figure of the ukrainian president zelensky i mean this is a man who's jewish who moves between these two languages ukrainian and russian and so he, he's he is this perfect kind of translational figure that 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 it carries with, 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 within him, you know, all, all these the, the kind of the, 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 the mnemonic, the memorial strands of, 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 the, of the culture um, itself. Well, one of the, the, the um, questions that um, I wanted to ask you, and, and this really when you were kind of conceiving of or, or thinking of the book, and I, I, I love this idea that you have of the kind of the field guide, kind of collecting things and seeing uh, what kind of patterns emerge, but was there a sense in which you, you, you wanted to look not so much as uh, translation invested in, in subjects, translation, translation invested in objects, that, that, to, to create some kind of material history of, of translation, but it's that translation is kind of, it's it's embedded in our town squares. It's, it's you know, it's, it's embedded in our, in, 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 in our, in our buildings, in, in our railway tracks. It's, you know, that it's, 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 you know, rather than thinking of as strictly speaking, a kind of a, um, a narrow textual interlinguistic interlingual exercise, but were you trying to this kind of broader material conception of, of what translation is? No, absolutely. You say it very well. Thank you, Michael. Absolutely, because um, it's not an abstract thing. Translation. It's 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 an activity that that uh, models our worlds and our existences, uh, whether it be in the city streets of uh, uh, of places we know well as as in montreal where we we you know we we embody it we encounter it every day um and uh um, in so many ways um and so many emotional ways and also the way we encounter it as we travel or as we know places partially or get to know them better so um you know one of the sparks of um uh the book came through the idea of when I'm uh, when you're traveling and I would hear a language that I wouldn't associate with with that place like why am I hearing Polish in Lviv well that's because you must be very ignorant not to know that Lviv was a Polish city um, for much of its existence so coming to grips with my own ignorance as I travel places and not of, of what I don't know and how language leads me to 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 investigate pushes me to investigate that uh, I'm in Barcelona and I see these uh, words with X's in them and I say what's that oh this is a Catalan city oh well I mean I learned that a while ago but I did have to learn it and I didn't know it before I went there so the, these are the way in which um, translation uh, language is a fact um, of of uh, your your material existence and also the kinds of um, at oddness that translation and uh, language can bring you when you go to a monument uh, you go to a synagogue synagogue with a name Santa Maria La Blanca well a synagogue can't be called Santa Maria La Blanca what's going on here and the at oddness of this experience of walking into a place that you know is inhabited by ghosts and and uh, you know specters of the past which are speaking in odd languages 
And sometimes those languages are the languages of tourists. I thought that that was such an interesting thing. This, this Lviv, the ghosts of Lviv come through the tourists, the German language tourists, the Jewish tourists. The, those are the voices that speak the history of the place, um, rather than the place itself being able to resurrect those languages because the languages have been eliminated uh, from, from those places. But you hear the echoes uh, through these different kinds of um, of musics that you that are available. Yeah, I mean it's interesting because that no notion of of of, of tourism or, or the nomadic. Is, I think of you know how we started our conversation and you were you were talking about these people kind of crisscrossing the city of Montreal. That people are kind of these traveling languages, but it's almost as if tourism itself is 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 a kind of a, a further extension of that that notion that that. That the languages return in this kind of, you know, that the, the, the physical translation from one space to, to the other is, 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 is the memory of, of that language that, you know, got translated in a particular direction. So, you know, so the Poles coming back uh, to uh, Lviv or the, 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 the Germans or wherever the particular uh, people might, might be. One of the, um, in the, in the different sites that you uh, mentioned in the, um, in the book. Um, there's two in particular kind of caught, caught my eye. Uh, one was the garden, um, because I think you have this the garden experience uh, here in, in, in Ireland, in, in County Wicklow, south of, 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 of Dublin. Uh, and the other was the mountaintop, because you've already mentioned uh, the, the, the movie Arrival and um, this. this um, uh, and I was thinking just in terms of, you know, uh, the age of the the the, the, the Anthropocene of of, of, of of climate change um the kind of the development um, of species awareness greater sensitivity to the more than than, than human uh, world um would you think of you know um, woods rivers uh valleys forests um as um a site of, 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 of translation? I mean, you know, which are inhabited by all these kind of different species with their own particular language. I mean, would you see a kind of a, a, an ecological turn in, in the way you could think about um, translation sites? I can only re relate that to, to, to the mountains that I know and frequent intimately, and that's my mountain here just down the street. <laughs> Which is Mount Royal, so I have a I, I I'm still very much in a you know in a, in the cultural mode. Um, what's interesting about this mountain? And as you speak, yes, I think I think for sure I think for sure we're we're you know the natural is is always being is being evolved by us. Um, what uh, when Frederick Law Olmsted, who is the um, um, Paysages, the, the uh, who 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 came to uh, to to convert this mountain into a park. Uh, he said, "This is a mountain. We must emphasize its mountainness." So his creation of the park, the natural park, was his intervention, his cultural intervention into the mountain to make it more of a mountain. So the the uh, interweaving of, of, of culture and nature, I think, is, 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 is uh, um, uh, inevitable, um, uh, all, all the more so within the city, but certainly um, w without. Um, interestingly enough, I actually did not visit that um, garden in County Wicklow. Did, have you, by any chance, Michael? Yes, you... I, I know, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, yeah. I, I heard about it. I just thought it was uh, so wonderful because of uh, uh, Lafcadi O'Hearn uh, being such a fascinating, uh, fascinating character. Uh, but I, I actually haven't visited, so that's a pleasure that awaits me next mm -hmm. time I'm in Ireland. Um, I, I, one of the things we, um, I suppose, perhaps as a way of, of, of linking the, 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 the two books um, is, you know, there was a kind of a notion that was knocking around for um, in the, the 60s and 70s and probably, probably good part of the 80s as well in the last century, which was the notion that basically uh, cities would become 
linguistically homogenous. It was the kind of uh, the melting pot model. Um, there's more and more people came into the cities. They come under the pressure uh, of you know a dominant uh, host language, and that would be the end uh, of the kind of the polyglot, uh, multilingual cities that we know. Um, but of course, all the literature that we have now uh, from uh, linguistic anthropology um, and sociology of language is that cities actually are going in the other direction. There's the phenomenon of what the, the late Jan Blumer calls linguistic super diversity. Um, see it in, in, in our own city here in, 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 in Dublin, just the, the explosion in the number of, of languages that are here in the city. Um, so in, in that respect, do you think um, that there is involved in, in translation uh, institutions. Is there a sense in which there's a kind of a mismatch between the translational realities of our cities um, and what we actually teach in our language and translation studies departments? Because many, many departments still will teach French, uh, English, uh, German, Spanish, and the kind of the uh, former imperial languages. Um, but how many? Uh, translation or language departments we have that teach uh, Urdu, that teach Tagalog, um, that teach uh, uh, Arabic, um, that teach uh, Bengali, um, that teach Hindi, um, but in this country teach Polish. I mean, so uh, do, do you think there's a kind of that the translational, all these translation changes that are happening in our city, that they're greatly outstripping the capacity of um, our discipline institutionally to, to, to address this, that, um, that this, we're kind of out of sync with, with that new reality? That, 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 that's a, a, a very important, a very, pardon? Yeah. Yeah, so sure, that's. froze there for, for a moment. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, okay. good, yeah, yeah, you're good. That, that that's a very important uh, observation, um, uh, both in teaching and uh, in research. Um, actually, I just uh, I have two uh, wonderful uh, master students now who are both working on a neighborhood of Montreal called Park Extension, which is one of the most uh, linguistically diverse uh, cities. And uh, one is in particular looking at um, um, at uh, the visual linguistic landscape and how it gets translated, and uh, trying to give agency. Where I mean, we're we're always going around and 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 uh, uh, correcting those people who, who have faulty uh, translations. But he wants to look at them as as you know how are they translating why are they translating why have they decided to choose this particular kind of uh, a visual uh, script um, on on in their um, shops so um, i think research too has to catch up on these kinds of uh, you know we, we use the word multilingualism uh, a little bit too um, cavalierly Every, multi everybody's multilingual new york is multilingual but to what extent are cities translational? That is, who is translating what? How are we getting to these these uh, different communities? Um, why are they? Why do they have to be translated into us? And how can we translate ourselves into them? So these are, you know, very much ongoing questions, hampered in some ways by by notions I think of of a kind of a happy multilingualism. The more languages, the better kind of thing, um, which is not. It's not how many languages it's how we can interact with them meaningfully and how they can interact with, with each other and and across communities not only towards english or french but you know bengali and uh, and urdu how how do uh, you know, or, or, or etc so and and our universities i think are hampered by the fact that we have these separate departments that's certainly the case here um in in canada where translation is the uh, um, has become, belongs to French English and belongs to the, uh, the, the, the well-oiled uh, bilingual translation machine, which we're grateful to have because it's a wonderful legacy and we've built it up uh, both as literary translation and um, as administrative translation. We've, we've, we've been able to grow, grow this tradition um, into something very, very 
viable and very strong, but it should not be to the exclusion of other languages. So yes, we, we, we do also have this kind of uh, institutional uh, struggle as, as how to get more languages. Great. Um, unfortunately, uh, Shira, I think we're going to have to bring our, our conversation to uh, a close. Um, I'm extremely grateful to the fact that you have got up <laughs> so early there uh, in, in, in Montreal uh, to be, it probably wasn't the way in which you anticipated having breakfast, but <laughs> it certainly, I think, has been um, a pleasure uh, and so instructive for all of us um, to uh, to listen to you uh, today. And I think in terms of what, you know, your, your closing remarks there, um, just how important and, and relevant um, cities and translation uh, and uh, translation sites uh, are to these continuing uh, debates about the nature and form uh, of, of, of contact. Um, I'd also um, I'd like to thank everybody um, that uh, listened uh, in or watched uh, us to today and to uh, remind uh, everybody that um, our next uh, conversation which will be held uh, next month uh, on the 19th uh, of May, so same time, lunchtime from, from one to two. Um, and our guest will be uh, Brian Baer, uh, who has uh, a book in the series uh, entitled uh, Queer Theory and uh, Translation Studies. So he'll be joining us uh, from Kent State uh, University uh, in the, uh, the US. Um, so uh, thank you again. Um, for uh, those of you who've enjoyed, um, our conversation. Um, you can find out uh, more information about uh, our events uh, on uh, our, our website that you can see here uh, on the, the slide. And you can also follow us uh, on various forms uh, of uh, social uh, media. Um, if you um, have uh, particularly uh, enjoyed our, our conversation, uh, you can uh, become a friend uh, of the, uh, the centre and you can find uh, details uh, on that uh, on the uh, TCLCT uh, website. Um, so thank you again uh, for uh, coming along. Argus Baniki Goleir, Assault As and Khoidjela Den Law. Slangafoyle.